This is episode 58 of the Magic Detective Podcast. On this episode, you'll hear about the life of Horace Golden, the royal illusionist. That and more on this episode of the Magic Detective Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Magic Detective Podcast, your podcast home for magic history. I'm your host, Dean Carnegie. I am the Magic Detective, and this is episode 58. Really quick in the news department, I have a little bit of uh, Houdini stuff for you. Uh, My friend, world champion illusionist Wayne Allen, has announced the Houdini Festival, which will be held at the Historic North Theater in Danville, Virginia, on April 8th through the 10th, 2021, April 6th was the date that Houdini celebrated his birthday, so we're keeping it around there. The Historic North Theater is a beautifully restored 1947 vaudeville house with 500 seats and a full balcony, owned and operated by Wayne Allen. And due to the pandemic, the number of in-person attendees is still kind of unknown. Uh, Even under the best scenario, there probably is going to be limited to only 313 in-person attendees. So everybody else will be virtual. Send an email to wayne at wayneallenmagic.com to get put on our mailing list for updates and things like that. Also, please put Houdini Festival in the subject line. A new website will be up sometime in November. A refundable $50 deposit for in-person attendees will be uh, will give you priority seating. Reservations can be made by calling 434-793-7469 or emailing Wayne at Wayne at WayneAllenMagic.com. The goal is to bring together Houdini aficionados, magic collectors, escape artists, and magicians. The Friday night show will feature Magic Castle Award winners, and the Saturday night show will showcase FISM winners, plus dealer displays, a viewing of Houdini, of the Houdini movie on the big screen, Houdini memorabilia uh, on display, and other surprises. Close-up shows will be held in the Balcony Mini Theater with beautifully raked ceiling to provide for an amazing viewing experience. The first 113-person registrants will watch the close-up live, while the others watch on the big screen in the main theater. Because of its uniqueness, we are hoping to receive national publicity not only in the magic press, but also in the mainstream media. And that's the press release from Wayne Allen, who is a um, big-time Houdini fan, aficionado, and um, has quite a bit of a unique history with uh, the Houdini world. So um, if you're interested, please check that out. Now, you may wonder, how do I choose from week to week who I'm going to cover on the podcast And the answer may come as a surprise. I may have told you before in in a previous podcast, I don't know. But the honest truth is, the name just pops in my head. Really, truly. Usually out of nowhere, I'll think about it. I'm like, who am I going to cover this week? Boom, a name just pops into my head. And that's what I go with. Sometimes more than one name pops into my head, in which case uh, I'll have to sit on it a day or so. But usually I'm. what's interesting, I'm right on the money with whoever I pick. Very rarely is it just drudgery, um, although that's happened as well. So if I try to force it, that's usually where the where it becomes difficult. But if uh, if I go with one of the name that, names that just pop in my head, usually it's a lot of fun doing the research on that. So our next feature is somewhat unique because he fits into different category of entertainers um and he's not the only one uh he's kind of a a heavy set performer and there have been a lot of them um right now i'm looking at being one myself uh (laughs) thank you pandemic you've been such a help um so uh yeah he's a a little um He's got a little size and girth going on him. Imro Fox was a big fella. Albini was a big fella. So there's been, you know, a few of them over the years. Not saying anything bad or good. Just kind of, you know, want to recognize him for for his great abilities beyond uh, being a little overweight. As a matter of fact, I will tell you that I was constantly surprised doing the research on this at how much Golden 
uh, did. Um, just blew my mind. So uh, I think you're really going to enjoy today's podcast. Hyman Goldstein was born in Vilna, Poland on December 17th, 1873. Now today that would be Vilnius in Lithuania, but the borders of Poland have changed since Hyman was born. He was roughly three months older than Houdini. He had a difficult childhood as the entire family was poor. His father left home when Hyman was very young. The father went to America to try and make a better life and then bring his family over. And they all assumed it would be a very short time. But in reality, it took eight years before they would see their father again. To make matters worse, as poor as they were, uh, when their father lived in Poland, things deteriorated after he left to levels quite extreme. Every member of the family had to work, including the young children. Hyman found an interest in music at a young age. Yes, music, not magic. He had dreams of being a huge success and playing the violin on stages across the globe. Even his mother secretly held on to these dreams as well. In the book, It's Fun to Be Fooled by Horace Golden, his autobiography, he tells the story of falling into a well as a young boy, and the fright from that ordeal caused him to have a stutter or stammer in his voice for years, and he also claims in the book to have self-corrected this ailment while in his teens. However, numerous magic books point out his speech issues as a professional performer. I think we'll find out later more about that. At 12 years of age, he discovered magic through a traveling fair that came to town. Hyman claims he was not impressed, however, with the magician. Perhaps he was a poor magician in technique, I don't know. But Hyman was able to learn more about doing tricks by watching him than one might imagine. He claimed what impressed him most were the audiences that gathered to watch the spectacle. For whatever reason, they were far more gullible than Hyman. Soon, magic began to be a hobby for Hyman. He practiced many of the things he saw, the sleight of hand and so forth. His own family at first declared him a demon until he was able to explain to them that they were all innocent tricks and not something in the league with the devil. Then the day came when they heard from their father. A letter arrived with enough money for tickets to America. However, as they would soon discover, the funds were one half ticket short. Hyman was now 16 years old and no longer eligible for a half ticket. To his disappointment, he was forced to remain behind as his entire family sailed to America. Now he's 16 years old with no place to live, no work, nothing. He quickly found odd jobs to do and, uh, and worked diligently until he had enough money to pay for that other half ticket. The trip to America on board ship took three weeks. Upon arriving in America, he found a new problem, and that was his inability to speak English. They slapped a, a luggage ticket on him and a big tag on his uh, luggage as well that said Nashville. That would be his final destination. His father and uncle had gone together in a grocery store business in Nashville, Tennessee. Soon, Hyman was living in Nashville and working at the store. He would learn English while he was working there. And whenever possible, he would entertain patrons with his magic skills. One thing, though, I found surprising about Hyman is that he still had dreams of being great in music, not magic. It hadn't even occurred to him that magic could be a thing. And that would change, though, soon enough when he moved to Roanoke, Virginia, to work with another uncle. This time, that uncle was selling jewelry. Hyman got involved in that and on the side was doing his best to learn the violin. And along the way, he met a traveling magician. He had this audacious idea of joining the man as an assistant. Why not do something you enjoy, he must have thought. It wasn't long before he saved up enough money and went out on his own. And he must have been a quick study where magic was concerned. One thing he did receive from this old gentleman was a name change. It was at this point he became Horace Golden. Now this is somewhat contrary to reports that I read that some sources say he was inspired by seeing Alexander Herman when the great artist came to Nashville. But Herman... Uh, is never mentioned in Golden's autobiography. As a matter of fact, in David Price's book, 
a pictorial history of magic and conjures in the theater, it actually says that uh, he saw Herman when he was in Nashville, but wasn't that impressed. How are you not impressed by Alexander Herman? I don't know, but I think it's because he still had his eyes and his heart set on music. And um, through this traveling salesman, all that shifted. He moved from Roanoke to Washington, D.C., and here's where he'd begin to make it big, he thought, and quickly discovered (laughs) the opposite. He was forced to get a normal job and work on show business in his off hours. And he also realized, I have no props. Horace was at this time still basically a sleight of hand worker. But then he met Herbert Albini. And by the way, Albini is covered in podcast episode 27, if you're interested. He saw Albini in Washington hold an audience mesmerized with the egg bag. And let me point this out. This was the Albini egg bag. The egg bag had been around for hundreds of years. It goes back to the days of Sir Isaac Fox and before. And it was always a really large uh, bag, probably about a foot and a half or two feet wide. And you could produce dozens of eggs and coins and even a chicken out of this thing. Albini shrunk the size of the bag down to make it more manageable. And he created a host of moves and things that you could do with it and really took it from a trick to a near miracle on stage. Well, Golden purchased an Albini style bag from a magic dealer and began to work on it, but he could never quite get it right. Albini had been able to turn this thing into a masterpiece with jokes and lines and bits of business. Golden had none of those, nor did he have the smooth technique. Now, Golden idolized Albini, and he even hung a poster of him in his room. And in the very near future, Golden ran into Albini again and invited him over. And the man was deeply touched when he when he saw the poster that... Uh, Golden had in his room. That's what, you know, he was deeply touched. And he removed a a photograph from his pocket and he signed it to Golden with these words. Golden is the only man authorized to present my egg bag. And then Albini began to teach Golden the ins and outs of the egg bag. And from that day on, Golden featured it in his show. Now, just as a side note, I know performers that hate the egg bag, and I know others that love the egg bag. Consider this. The following people thought the egg bag was near uh, was a near-perfect mystery. Johnny Thompson, Charlie Miller, Denny Haney, me, if I even fit in that category, and many others. And, and that's, of course, uh, assuming the trick is presented properly. Now, if you listen to the podcast on Al- Albini, you'll recall he was a kind of a difficult person, and that was mainly due to his drinking. And Golden was also known to be difficult, though on that front I've yet to come to really a conclusion on that. In regards to Albini, some years later, he and Golden had a falling out over the egg bag. And then, as strange as it is, a few years after that, they reconnected. But they were never quite as close as they were in the early days. Now, this information comes from Golden's autobiography. It mentions that it was probably due to uh, Albini's alcoholism. Now, I'll say up until this point, I didn't know about Golden's sleight of hand ability. I'd always heard of him as an illusionist. And as it happens, we're about to step into that world. This is something to pay close attention to because, well, because of the way that Golden chose to present his illusions. His first illusion was ripped from the pages of the news, to steal a phrase from that's often used today. Indeed, in the news in 1894 was a spy thriller being prosecuted in court. A French artilleryman, Alfred Dreyfus, was convicted by secret military court for having given away secrets to a foreign power. He was sentenced to life imprisonment at Devil's Island in French Guiana. He was formally degraded by having his rank insignia, buttons, and braids cut from his uniform and his sword broken all before a silent rank of soldiers. Dreyfus swore his innocence, and by 1899 there seemed to be proof coming out that it was indeed a different officer who was guilty of being the real traitor. 
The same year, Dreyfus was given a second trial and again declared guilty of treason. However, later in 1899, due to public pressure, the president of France, Emile Dubot, had him released from prison. In 1906, Dreyfus was a officially exonerated by military court and and readmitted into the military with her promotion and other accolades. Well, and by the way, this uh, Alfred Dreyfus, he has a famous ancestor that you may know as uh, Julia Louise Dreyfus from Seinfeld. Yeah, they're related. Well, in 1902, Horace Golden decided to seize upon this worldwide story and create an illusion around it. He himself would play the part of Dreyfus, and he would be brought on stage by soldiers. He would be formally degraded, just as the real Dreyfus had been. And then he would be placed into a tall, upright cage. Soldiers would surround it. The proceedings were conducted by the accuser, Esther Hazy, dressed as the devil. At some point, Mrs. Dreyfus comes in, pleading for her husband, and is escorted away. A curtain goes up. Around the, um, around the cage, the devil officer commands the soldiers to present arms and prepare to fire, gives the signal to fire, but instead of firing, the curtain is suddenly dropped, and inside the cage is Mrs. Dreyfus. A moment later, the officer, dressed as a devil, removes his cloak to reveal he is golden. It is certainly a topical illusion and one that really connected with European audiences. This type of illusion is popular, but rarely done with such a topical storyline. Brilliant move on the part of Golden. If you recall earlier on, I mentioned the stammer that Golden had as a boy. As it turns out, this was not his only speech issue. A drama critic by the name of Alan Dale wrote a brief review of Golden's show and pointed something out. Here's what he said. Horace Golden is a promising young man who will one day make a name for himself. I enjoyed his performance. But if you want to enjoy his performance, I suggest you put cotton wool in your ears so that you do not hear his broken English. Imagine such a quote today. (laughs) Alan Dale would be run out of the business. Thankfully, the truth was spoken and Golden chose to do something about it. His solution was to perform his act silently, and this helped to set him aside from all the other performers and put him on the road to stardom. Now, from what I can uncover, it appears he did the majority of his act silently, but he still had routines where he spoke, the egg bag, for example. Along with doing the show silently, he also sped up the performance. He would often refer to it as 45 tricks in 17 minutes. The change in style helped him to move up the show business ladder, but one particular trick would help to take him over the top, and I think it had more to do with his showmanship than just the trick. It was the aerial fishing routine, where a fish is caught on the end of a line by magic. And by the way, that particular trick is also covered on podcast number 27. Golden placed the goldfish bowl filled with fish in the lobby of the theater with a sign that read, these fish caught magically out of the air by magician H. Golden. In every show, he was opening his act by catching fish. Another story Golden shares from his autobiography took place at the old opera house in Washington, D.C. Most people knew the venue as Chase's Polite Vaudeville, It was frequented by one Harry Houdini many, many times, which is why I know of it. It's also one of the many venues in Washington that got torn down in the 1970s when the city was trying to upgrade its image. So the story is Golden gets booked at Chase's. He opens his act with a routine where he makes five ducks vanish. But on this night, one duck got free so he could only make four vanish. But unknown to him, the fifth duck was standing behind him, kind of waddling around, standing behind him, looking at him. And when Golden turned, that duck quacked and quacked at him. And this sent the audience into hysterics. They thought it was the funniest thing they'd ever seen. And Golden, however, was thinking his act was dying on stage and he had to do something to salvage it. And he grabbed the fifth duck and he placed it in a pan and then made the other four reappear with him. The audience loved it. But after the show, 
Golden was called to Mr. Chase's office. It was a sure sign he was going to be fired. When he saw Mr. Chase, the man was smiling and asked Golden if he'd like to extend his contract a week. Horace Golden was expecting to be fired, and here was a man saying, Would you like to do another week? Golden wasn't sure what what to do, (laughs) but his showbiz instincts kind of kicked in, and he said, I can, but with an increase in wages, $25. Mr. Chase agreed heartily and drew up the new contract. What had happened, all that laughter from the, uh, the duck getting out made its way up to Chase's office, and he thought the act was just crushing it and wanted to compensate Golden properly. And now for a quick commercial. Hello, my name is Billy Diamond, and I've been a magician for over 40 years. When I'm not performing, I help other entertainers build a successful brand presence. Maybe you're frustrated because you struggle in the entertainment business. I can tell you this, if you're looking for valuable insights into the most common and frustrating identity issues that both amateur and even professional entertainers face, the Branding for Entertainers podcast will help you shine. My podcast guests also share their stories, and together we'll bring you some practical advice about the business of entertainment. We'll help you polish your visual, verbal, and even your virtual identity so that entertainment buyers, agents, and even your live audience will begin to listen. You can listen to this podcast for free at brandingentertainers.com forward slash podcast. That's podcast with an S on the end. You can listen on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or even your favorite podcast platform. So join us for the Branding for Entertainers podcast, and we'll help you grow your entertainment career. The year is 1901. Horace Golden received his first booking in London. The last time he was in London, well, he was a young boy traveling alone on his way to America. And now he was here with the visions of conquering all of Europe with his magic, thanks to Tommy Downs. Golden was to appear at the Palace Theatre. His shows were extremely well-received. In fact, so well-received, the management extended his contract to 16 more weeks with an increased salary. And at first, Golden didn't know what to do because he had shows booked in the U.S., but this option was in his contract and he had to adhere to it. Fortunately for him, it was a positive outcome. He became very popular in England and soon received an invitation to perform before King Edward VII. This would be the first of many appearances before royalty. In fact, Horace Golden would set a record for the most number of appearances before royalty in a week's time. His concept of the silent act really played strong in Europe. In addition, his topical routine about the Dreyfus affair seemed to plug into current events. This is genius, really. From this point on, he changed his moniker. He had been known during his career as the humorous conjurer, the whirlwind wizard, and now he would become the royal illusionist. Certainly not the first magician to take that title, but he had certainly earned it. After his time in England, he became a world traveling illusionist. Around 1915, he was performing before the King of Siam. Golden added a new allusion to the show, The Lion's Bride. However, rather than use a real lion, he changed the routine and called it the Tiger God. Not, not, not the Tiger King. That's, <laughs> that's something else. He used a live tiger, and it was extremely popular. Hey, all you cool cats and kittens. And now we come to 1918. From the book, The Great Illusionist by Derek Tate, I see that he was traveling around the globe from Australia and heading towards the Hawaiian Islands. Apparently near La Hyena, Hawaii, the ship carrying Golden, his crew and all his props, and all his money, sank. However, in his autobiography, he gives a very different account of this event. Apparently his illusions were being moved from one ship to another because the large ship wouldn't fit into the harbor. In the course of loading some huge 700-pound glass illusion, the rope snapped, dropping the huge glass onto the smaller boat, which then capsized it, and all his wonderful illusions drifted to the bottom of the sea. If it had been in the shallow part of the harbor, I think everything would have been okay. 
but this was a very deep section of ocean. He was able to recover a few illusions, but there was damage all around. Uh, No mention in the biography of the monies lost, but I can imagine it was a lot. He tried to sue the shipping company for negligence, but was told not to. It was explained to Golden that the guy who owns the shipping company is going to be related to the lawyer prosecuting him, and they're both going to be related to the judge. So basically, you've got zero chance of anything happening. So he just gave up. Golden distrusted banks and kept most of his money in gold bars. So anyone interested in deep sea diving, perhaps you can locate that part of the sunken treasure. It may still be out there. Oh, and if you're in that area at night, check out Warren and Annabelle's Magic Show, which plays right there on the island of Maui. So was that the end of Golden? Hardly. His next big adventure does more to solidify his place in the annals of magic. He invents the sawing a lady in half. Or, wait, did he? As it turns out, P.T. Selbit came out with a mystery he called Sawing Through a Woman. That's when Golden came out and said, wait a minute, I've been working on this mystery for a couple of years, and you're ripping me off. The illusion had some similarities to Golden, but really, uh, they were quite different. Golden's version was not quite finished, but thanks to some assists by Dante and others, the completed version was ready. And they did something unprecedented in the world of magic. They leased out the illusion to all the top pros. So Golden had one, Dante had one, Thurston had one, Survey Leroy, Carl Rosini, and others. It debuted all over America in 1921. And Golden played it up big by having an ambulance parked in the front of the theater. After every show, buckets of fake blood would be taken and thrown out into the sewer. A simply brilliant way to promote this illusion. It should be noted, Selbit and Golden fought over this back and forth, and Golden would sue anyone caught presenting the sawing in half without his permission. It's safe to say that magicians milked every dollar they could out of the sawing in half illusion. But Golden was hardly finished. In 1931, he brought out a new version of the sawing, and this really breaks new ground. In this new version... The lady lays belly down on a table, and a very large lumber circular saw cuts right through her body. No coverings of any kind. This would become a staple in the shows of Blackstone Jr. and Sr., as well as Ricciardi. Aldo Ricciardi scared the living daylights out of of his 20th century audiences. He dressed in a doctor's medical gown and used his daughter in the illusion. And as the saw cut through her visible body, organs and intestines could be seen to be flowing out from her body. It was horrific and awesome all at the same time. Uh, Horace Golden really was a rare performer and creator, much like Sir Bailey Roy before him. In regards to his personal life, I found this in David Price's book, A Pictorial History of Conjures in the Theater. When he was 21, this is Golden, when he was 21, he met a woman named Helen Layton in California, and he proposed to her. She turned him down. Then, as fate would have it, when he was 41, 20 years later, he again met her, the same woman, in Chicago, and she turned him down. Ouch. Then, when he was 54, I can hardly say this. Then, when he was 54 years old, he ran into her. (laughs) He ran into her again. This time in merry old England. No, Horace, don't do it. Don't do it. He did it. He did it. He proposed again. Uh, Dude, have some pride. Well, this time. She said yes. Whoa. That is persistence for you. Or international stalking, you decide. Now, according to the Sphinx magazine, Horace Golden performed at St. George's Hall, the great masculine venue, 
It is pointed out he was the only uh, world-famous magician to ever appear on their stages. This was in 1925 and 1927. Towards the end of his career, Golden was still creating, still adding new material. He chose to take on the Indian rope trick, though I think a bit reluctantly. His research led him to believe that perhaps it was nothing more than a fable and no one had ever really seen it for real. He eventually devised a method that could be done indoors and promoted it like crazy. In fact, he had a great pitch for this that he used in his show, and here is the pitch. Ladies and gentlemen, I now have the pleasure of presenting to you the most talked of trick in the universe, the trick you have no doubt read about in the press, the Indian rope trick as performed by the yogis. It seems that the yogis are the only people to know the secret of this phenomenon. During my travels in India, I met a very holy man, Yogi Karam Dumblia. We became very friendly and we exchanged ideas. He showed me, among other things, how it was possible to hang head downwards from a tree for days. It came to my knowledge that this yogi was a master of the Indian rope trick which was performed as a sacred and secret religious rite, and I asked him to divulge the secret. For many days he refused, but at last he imparted the secret after I had sworn an oath not to perform it until he passed away. I have waited 18 years. I was sworn to secrecy in a very strange fashion. The holy man ran a sharp instrument across the back of his hand, so that blood appeared. Then he asked me to place my left hand on the back of his right, and he told me that if the blood dried within five minutes, I was not to be trusted. It was fifteen minutes before that blood disappeared, and thereupon the yogi told me the secret. His final show finds him at the Wood Green Empire Theatre in London. Now, if that theatre sounds familiar, it should. It's the same place Chung Ling Su lost his life presenting the bullet-catching feat. It was August 22, 1939. Horace Golden presented his version of the famous bullet-catching feat that night and was successful. He went home to retire for the night and died at his home. Golden was 65 years old. No cause of death is listed from what I've seen, likely a heart attack, I would guess. He is buried in the Jewish cemetery, Glebe Road, Wilsden, London. And all I can say about that story is, wow. There, there is actually a lot I didn't even cover. I could have gone on a lot. I could have gone on probably more than an hour. I have a feeling there's going to be a second podcast devoted to more specific things in Golden's life. Wow. This, this is why I do this podcast. I love finding out information on these past masters. And this was just such a joy to research and bring to you. My friends, if you enjoyed the Magic Detective podcast, please consider giving me a five-star review on iTunes. It helps me immensely in the rankings. Also, please like and share the podcast with your friends or anyone you know who might enjoy the podcast. I wonder if I'm going to hear anything from golden descendants that still live in Nashville. Hmm. That would be cool. That would be so cool. At any rate, thank you for listening to the podcast. My name is Dean Carnegie. I am the Magic Detective. Until next time, be well and be safe. Mm -hmm.